came down with whatever crud is going around, so I'm a little snotty today at the Rona. I don't think it's Corona if it is like half of us have it, so <laughs> I was reassured by other, the first time I've been reassured by other people being sick. <laughs> Alright, let's go ahead and turn to James chapter 1, okay?
and say with all honesty, I feel the same way for each of you. True biblical love concerns itself with truth and spiritual health. Any definition of love that prioritizes temporal things above spiritual is not biblical or godly love. And it's summarized in this way in 3 John, when he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. This idea of not departing, of not erring. The combination of genuine love and knowledge of the Bible results in, a, in the kind of plain speech that James uses. He doesn't, he doesn't give just a suggestion or even make an implication. When the Bible is applied property there, properly, there is clarity and authority in what we say because it's coming from God's Word. Do not depart from the truth. What are some ways that we can go astray? What are some ways that we can't go astray? <laughs> In verse 1, we learned about humility. In verses 2 through 4, we studied patience. Last week, we covered wisdom and faith. All these topics appear in the context of trials and tribulations because that is what was going on when James wrote this letter to those believers. What about today? <clears throat> verse 9. But the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So beginning in verses 9 and 10, we see two different groups of people described. The rich man and the poor man. The brother of low degree refers to a fellow believer who struggles because he has very little. The word degree means humiliated, cast down, or lowly. An impoverished believer responds differently to trials and hardships than a wealthy person. Again, I feel a little silly even talking about poverty or anything like that in our context because we live in a very affluent, wealthy society. Lack or the not having what we want or even sometimes what we need is one of the first ways that a Christian can err from the truth of God's Word. When forced into poverty or into a difficult situation, true tendencies and beliefs become immediately clear. All the faking goes by the wayside. An excellent example is presented for us in the book of Exodus. Uh, let's turn to Exodus chapter 16. So this first point is not erring in the matter of lack or poverty. Exodus chapter 16 and verses um, 1 through 3. Moses, 
and said, Wherefore is that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Lastly, go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21, verses 5 through 6. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? What is what? These maliciously brought you out of Egypt to kill you? Yeah. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So I use this example because the type of murmuring and complaining that the Israelites participated in show us rejoicing in the midst of trials begins with a heart attitude and a heart condition. The first temptation that faces the believer who owns very little or possesses doesn't have the things he needs is to grow bitter against God and even to blame him for the hard times. A poor believer may lack many of the things that he desires. This lack can even include the choices and opportunities that a wealthier person might have. He might even be looked down on by the wealthy. The poor is faced with the temptation to covet, lie, and steal. Rather than surrender to these temptations, the poor man is told to do something different. He's told to rejoice in that he is exalted. Though he doesn't have many material things, he's a child of God. He will reign with Christ forever. He has been adopted by God, and he has been blessed by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. The lowly Christian has an inheritance reserved in heaven. Despite any distress we might encounter, the believer possesses the indwelling Holy Spirit and all the promises of God to encourage and satisfy him. The poor believer must not allow himself to depart from the truth by becoming discouraged and bitter, he must fix his eyes on Christ. The Christian must not err in the midst of poverty, difficulty, and trial. Okay, so that's the first way in which we can depart from the truth of God's Word, the way we can err. The second way we can do that is found in verses 10 and 11. But the rich, in that he has made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. And the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. The poor, those who don't have very much, are instructed to rejoice, because they are exalted spiritually in Christ. The rich are told to rejoice because they are made low. Again, here we have to look beyond external possessions and riches to the condition of the heart. Apart from Christ, every man is spiritually bankrupt and doomed to eternal spiritual poverty. The rich can, is possible they may not perceive this. Wealth is very deceitful. It masks spiritual needs with temporal comfort. It's one of the reasons why a very affluent society often is full of people with very hard hearts against truth. Jesus addressed a rich young man in Mark chapter 10. That's exactly what was going on. This young ruler believed he was righteous because he was privileged and because he had kept what he thought was all of the commandments. Jesus directly challenged his self-righteousness and his corrupt heart. After that exchange, the Bible says the man went away grieved for he had great possessions. Jesus taught about the difficult nature of entering the kingdom of God as a wealthy person. This barrier is not because it's any harder for God to grant salvation to the rich. It's simply because it's very tough for such a person to let go of their love for wealth. I'd say this is more applicable to us in this society with the great number of possessions and things that we have. It's always easier to trust in the temporal at expense of the spiritual. You guys remember the example of Esau? He traded in the spiritual blessing of the birthright for the physical comfort to relieving his hunger. It's exactly what we're talking about here. Unfortunately, because of the physical ease brought by material gain, the wealthy may go their entire lives never evaluating their spiritual condition and never being 
challenge to take stock of their lives. When Jesus addressed the Laodicean church in Revelation, he talked about how even one of the Lord's churches is capable of falling into this condition, of becoming totally complacent and spiritually blind because of material comfort and wealth. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. The problem in our text here, and evidenced at the church of Laodicea, is not just caused by having a bunch of money. The Laodicean church was lukewarm because they said, I am rich, and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. It's obvious their faith was no longer resting in Christ. They testified they were rich and didn't need anything. This is a kind of spiritual blindness that will cause the believer to err from the truth. We see a, a balance presented here between the, the poor man and the rich man, and the need to stay right in the middle where the Bible is, not to go too far either way. According to Mark, this tendency to err from the truth is a fundamental heart problem, and the eventual result is a disregard of God's word and ultimate unfruitfulness. It says, in the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, enter again, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. That's Mark 4, 19. And look at James 1, 11. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. You guys know, the Bible's full of teaching on the brevity of life, the shortness of life, the need to prioritize eternal things now. It's also full of teaching on the uncertainty of riches. Trusting in wealth comes with a really unfortunate irony. The very comforts that actually blind the soul from recognizing its true condition all eventually vanish. As the introductory examples of the people that won millions of dollars show us, even vast riches can be lost overnight, instantly. The wealthy are exhorted to rejoice because they have been made low. This lowering refers to the total spiritual transformation that accompanies salvation. The wealthy believer recognizes the truth about himself, independent from his wealth, and about his riches. Only then is he able to spiritually be spiritually equipped to steward his possessions, even as a wealthy believer, in the right way, and also to respond biblically when faced with sudden trial or poverty. The rich are not asked to rejoice in the providence of God that has made them wealthy, but in the grace of God that makes and keeps them humble, and in the trials and temptations that teach him to place his confidence in God and not in his quickly fading wealth. First Peter provides us with an excellent summary of this principle, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. The word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. That's 1 Peter 1, 23-25. When James warns us not to err, one of the things he's addressing is our response to difficulties. And our responsibility doesn't change whether we're poor or whether we're wealthy. Trials display the true condition of the lowly believer's heart, and they demonstrate exactly where the rich man has placed his trust. Are we like Laodicea? Do we have need of nothing? All of us are very wealthy by the world's standards, and we each possess far more than we need to survive. Our text exhorts us not to depart from the faith or to despise the truth by trusting in uncertain riches. Just set those things aside, no matter how much money or how little money you have, set them aside. They're not eternal things. As believers, we should rejoice in the fact that we've been given great spiritual light through salvation and access to God's Word. The ability to even talk about this accurately, these subjects of wealth and poverty, is evidence of God's grace present in our lives. The challenge is to not err from the truth by allowing possessions to rule our hearts. Spiritual blindness prevents us from seeing that from God's perspective, our 
Our material success leaves us spiritually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Uh, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. All right, so we've looked at two ways. We can err from God, the truth of God's word, or biblical example in poverty. We can also do that in wealth, by trusting in riches that pass away. The third way we can do it is evidenced by our response to these different difficulties that come to us. The word endureth in verse 12 is the Greek word hupomeno, which it means to have fortitude, to abide, or to persevere. The word temptation in this verse still fits in the context of persecution and hardship. We learn in this verse that when we are tested by trials, we will receive the crown of life. This is a sure promise of God to those who persevere. The crown of life refers to the believer's position of authority with Christ in glory. In 2 Timothy, it's also called a crown of righteousness. In 2 Timothy 4.8, it says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. In 1 Peter, it's called a crown of glory. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. 1 Peter 5, 4. The crown of life is promised in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to the overcomer. It's the same theme we're covering today. The overcomer is the one who is born again through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, and who exhibits this in this life by his testimony and his willingness to suffer for Christ. According to Revelation 2.26, the overcomer keeps Christ's works unto the end. Those who err in the matter of trials show that they were likely never saved to begin with. These believe for a time only and then turn away when things get tough. Hebrews chapter 10 describes such people as drawing back unto perdition. Those that turn back are those that did, do not possess true saving faith and never did have it. There are many things that accompany salvation. One of these is not erring and backing away when faced with temptations. The overcomer who is tried and tested will sit with Christ in his throne. One day Christ will rule the world and the saints will rule with him. What an exaltation of lowly sinners. What a great part of our salvation. James teaches us we are blessed when we endure hardship with fortitude. We are challenged not to draw back, but to press onward towards the prize. In the first four verses of today's text, James deals with the biblical perspective on poverty and wealth and challenges us to maintain a godly testimony despite adversity. For the remainder of the message, we'll focus on the second part of what he's saying here, his exhortation. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In a recent survey conducted by Western Reserve University, a psychologist named Julie Exline determined that approximately two-thirds of people admit that they frequently feel angry and blame God for their suffering in difficult circumstances. It's a lot. <laughs> Despite such a common tendency, today's text shows us that blaming God for our hardships is sin. Ignorance of the Lord and His ways is what causes people to attribute their own temptations to God. James gives us the fourth warning. The believer is to not err by blaming the results of sin on God. Everything that we've covered in the epistle of James up to this point displays the grace and perfection of God in His work in our lives. He was not obligated to give us any instructions or guidance on how to handle any difficulties that come our way. He did it because he chose to. In verses 2 through 4, we learn that God is fully capable of transforming trials, encountering hardship when properly understood, versus patience and spiritual maturity in the life of the Christian. Understanding what is happening in the midst of the challenges enables us to endure temptation.
salvation. And verse 12 just showed us that the believer who endures is blessed and will receive a crown of life. Now James addresses the believer who refuses to do that, who refuses to endure. This is the Christian who becomes discouraged and allows his heart to be hardened against God's work. When we justify sinful actions, it leads to a warped perspective on what the truth is. When we justify difficult situations, it leads to a warped perspective on God and his work in our lives. Verse 13 begins with the command, let no man say. This phrase is further clarified in verse 14, which begins, but every man. The words in these verses show us that God's command applies to every man that has ever existed. It's important to see that while James is writing to Jewish Christians, these statutes of God apply to us all. Hints have already appeared during our study. If any of you lack wisdom, and giveth to all men our examples, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Up to this point in our text, the word temptation has been talking specifically about the various trials and persecutions that might come against the life of a believer. The word has remained the same in the Greek language, but the meaning has shifted now from the context of trials to more of the context of moral temptation related to sin, which you guys might think of more commonly when we say temptation. We know this because of verse 14 and 15, which describe the cycle of mankind's sin and eventual spiritual death. The transition taken by the word temptation in verse 13 shows us a couple things. God is not the author of sin and the temptations that arise out of it. The trials and persecutions that Christians might encounter also originate in sin. And they also cannot be attributed to God as the cause. He may allow things to happen, but he is not the cause of the sin. James 2.6 says, Do not rich men oppress you? And drawing you before the judgment seats, do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? The blasphemy and persecution committed by the rich men in this verse is because of their rejection of God. The persecution and hardship facing the scattered Jewish believers came from the same place as their own sin, and James addresses any who believe otherwise. Our chief flaw is our constant and aggressive justification of our own iniquity. It's what we all do and our desire to lay the blame anywhere but at our own feet. Justification of sin without repentance results in eternal damnation. In the context of trials, it results in a hard-hearted and bitter attitude towards the Lord. In Genesis chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12, we see an example of this. Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? What did the man say? The woman... The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. It's your fault, God, and you gave her to me. She messed up. It's not me. It couldn't possibly be me. Let no man say means that we are not to place the blame for any of our sin or difficulties caused by sin on God. He is not the author of original sin. It's very bad to sin, but it is much worse when we have done amiss to charge it upon God and say it was owing to him. Those who lay the blame of their sins, either upon their constitution or upon the condition of the world, or who pretend that they are under a fatal necessity of sinning, wrong God, as if he were the author of sin. Afflictions, as sent by God, are designed to draw out our graces, but not our corruptions. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. <coughs> The fourth way that we can begin to err from the truth of God's word is to begin attributing our sins and trials to God and to blame him for our situation. Such an error destroys any chance of our obedience to him, any chance of sanctification. Blaming God for suffering is the opposite of counting it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. We are warned by our text today not to fall into this trap. Lost or desperate to blame anyone and everything for their sins and suffering. And the believer needs to understand exactly where sin and temptation comes from so he can respond to it appropriately. Just as a right response to trials can result in growth to full spiritual maturity, so a wrong response to lust will result in decline to abject spiritual poverty and ultimately 
to death itself. The final consequence of death brings us to the last error addressed in our text. If you look at verses 14 and 15, these two short verses lay out one of the clearest descriptions of human nature we could find in the scripture. It says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We just learned that sin cannot be blamed on God. And now James tells us exactly where sin is born and what it produces. The verses destroy the idea that temptation is something that can be separated out from the corrupt human heart. And they also demonstrate how Jesus' response to sin was completely different. Verse 13 showed us that God cannot be tempted with evil. Not only did the Son of God have no sin, he could not sin. Jesus was not merely an ordinary man with some special resistance to sin. As Almighty God, he was completely holy. He could not be tempted with evil because of his very nature. Yet a God that's separate from sin by any other means besides his very nature itself is a lesser God than the God of the Bible. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ encountered all of the same opportunities that we do, all the same opportunities to sin that other men do, yet he conquered them without any sin. He was in all points tempted just like we are. If we connect the passage in Hebrews with the verses in James, it provides us with a complete picture of the heart of the sinner. The final way that our text describes erring from the truth of God's word is in the matter of sin. One of the largest freshwater turtles is the alligator snapping turtle. Found primarily in the southeastern United States, these massive turtles have been known to weigh close to 250 pounds. They're carnivorous. While their diet is primarily fish, they've been known to eat almost anything else they can find in the water, even in a few cases, small alligators. The alligator snapping turtle relies on a uniquely deceitful method for foraging for fish. The turtle will lie completely still on the floor of a lake or river with its mouth wide open. At the end of the turtle's tongue is a small, pink, worm-shaped appendage. The turtle wiggles the end of its tongue so it looks like a worm moving through the water. When a fish comes to eat the worm, the turtle's jaws rapidly close, trapping the fish so it cannot escape. Similarly to the snapping turtle's lure, temptation comes in the guise of something desirable, always something desirable, but it always carries destruction with it in the end. If we could see the end result rather than the tempting part, it wouldn't be an issue. If we could see what drugs do the body before we started taking them, we would never take them. If we could see what pornography will do to the mind and heart 10 years in, we would never start being involved with that. If we could see what lying and cheating and being bitter and harsh do, we would never engage in those things either. We need to understand that temptation will never come to us in any form that is undesirable. That's the point. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The temptation to sin comes from our fallen nature inherited from Adam. According to Scripture, man's natural heart is sinful. Matthew 15, 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. The nature we're born with is called the flesh in Galatians, and the old man in Ephesians. In James, we see that this is our greatest enemy. It is an enemy that resides within and not without. Since our heart is corrupted, we must not trust it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We must not err from the truth by placing the responsibility regarding sin somewhere else. The young man in Proverbs who was enticed by an immoral woman was drawn by his own immoral lust. Judas was drawn by his own covetous lust. In verse 15 we see that lust entertained and acted on is 
with sin. First the sin draws away, then it entices us. The opposite, personal holiness, also consists of two things. We need to forsake what is evil and cleave to what is good. When we reverse those, we come away with these two aspects of sin, the drawing and the enticing. The words drawn away in James means being forcibly hailed or compelled, literally dragged away from what is true and right. The word translated as enticed signifies being beguiled or subtly tricked by deceitful things. Lust arises in our corrupt hearts without us even trying, but it can be rejected or entertained. Jesus taught that if a man acts upon lust, even in the privacy of his own heart, he is sinning in God's eyes. Sin brings death, spiritual, physical, and eternal. Sin also brings death into the Christian's life. Sin kills being spirit-filled. It destroys faith. It destroys godly relationships. It destroys testimonies, marriages, ministries, and churches. We have to be serious about it. As Christians, we may be tempted to err or to depart from God's word in the matter of sin. But we must endure temptations and not allow ourselves to be drawn away from the truth of God's word by the enticing power of our own lust. The first step towards that happening is blaming it on somebody else. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Understand, this is a promise. You're not original. No matter what you come up with to engage yourself in and do, regardless of whether you think you're different, this is another promise of God's Word. This is just the way it works out. It will result in death. Ezekiel 33.11 is a plea to such a Christian. It says, Why will you die, O house of Israel? God takes no pleasure in the death of people. And he has no hand in their sin, but both sin and misery are owing to ourselves. Sorry, part of that was a verse and the part of it was a quote. The verse is, why will you die, O house of Israel? God takes no pleasure in the death of people. And he has no hand in their sin, but both sin and misery are owing to ourselves. Our own hearts' lusts and corruptions are the tempters. And when by degrees they have carried us off from God, to finish the power and dominion of sin, they will prove our destroyers. As I wrap this up today, we've looked at five different things present in James 1, 9 through 16. In verse 16, we are challenged to not err from the faith and to not depart from the truth of God's word. There's some different ways this can occur in the life of a believer. The first one was, do not depart from the truth in the matter of poverty. Instead, rejoice that you are exalted in Christ. Next, do not depart from truth in the matter of wealth. Instead, rejoice that you've been made low through salvation, that you have a proper perspective on what you have. Third, do not depart from truth during any trials and temptations. Instead, endure looking to the promises of God. Fourth, do not depart from truth by blaming God for temptations. Instead, leave the blame where it belongs, on our own corrupt hearts. And lastly, do not depart from truth in the matter of sin. Instead, resist the drawing power of lust. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning and the chance to be in your house. I pray that we would continue to grow together as a church and individually. That we would uh, not depart from your word in any way person here who has done so, that they understand uh, that this process of sin is the same for every person, regardless of the situation or what is occurring. Pray that you help us to take it very seriously, and that we would draw close to you, walk close with you, and uh, strengthen each other. Thank you for your salvation and for your word. Amen.